All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. Uh, it's the 2023 grant overview session, and we appreciate all of you here with us. As we are going along, um, our staff, and they'll introduce themselves here in a minute, will be allowing people coming in and out. So if the dinging won't bother you too much, we might make that quiet. <laughs> um, but welcome. My name is Erin Johnson. I'm Vice President for Community Investment here at the South Carolina Community Foundation. Um, it is a joy uh, to be with you here today, and I'm excited to, to share with you some of the, the work we got going on this year. A lot of it's stuff that we've been doing for a long time, so it won't be super new information for many of you, but we want to make sure you have a chance to hear from us about the open and closed dates and sort of what we're looking for, um, and also want to make sure you get a chance to get to know our incredible team, our community investment team. So I will um, turn it over. I'll ask um, Chantrell Haley and Teresa to introduce themselves, and then we'll get going. Hello, everyone. My name is Chantrell Mitchell. I am the Community Investment Associate here at the Foundation. Um, I support Haley, Tremise, and Aaron with the grant making process, and I also oversee Midless Gives and Black Philanthropy Month. Hey, everyone. I'm Haley Brazier. I'm one of the program officers here. We'll be talking today about some of uh, the grants that I oversee. Uh, I also oversee our scholarship uh, program as well. Hi, everyone. I am Tremise Carter. I am a program officer here at the foundation, and I will also be talking about some of the grants that I oversee. Great. Well, let's get to it then. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide. And uh, just to give you a big picture overview, so everyone is sort of on board and understands exactly what it is that uh, we do and how we do it. Um, a community foundation is a 501c3 public charity, just like all of you. Uh, we have a board of directors who um, oversee our, our sort of our operations. Uh, we have our collection of flexible funds. So a community foundation has a whole lot of funds in it um, that kind of all the funds combine to make a big foundation. Generally, community foundations are geographically bound. Uh, we are up the 11 counties of the Midlands. I like to say from Saluda to Clarendon and Lee, from Newberry, um, uh, Fairfield down to Orangeburg, Calhoun. And so we're, we're the 11 counties sort of in the Midlands. Uh, and then there are other community foundations. There are about, I'd say, maybe six or seven other community foundations that serve the state. Um, and we're here in the, in the middle of the state. Uh, some community foundations do um, are sort of issue-based, but ours is really just serving the community. And our overall goal is to increase the livability of our community. Um, we do uh, want to be sort of a, an essential partner in philanthropy. Uh, we do our best, this uh, small but mighty team, to sort of have a good understanding of what is going on in our communities, which is why we love to meet with you all and talk with you all. And if you have coalitions, we'd like to, to know about that so we can learn a little bit more about what's going on in our communities and we can be responsive to that. We can also help donors, individuals and family foundations and such who are looking for ways to invest. Uh, we can also help direct them to some of the work that's being done in our communities. But we want to be able to know what's going on, what the issues are, and also what sort of things that you all are doing to address that. Um, and I did mention about donors. So community foundations are a funny little thing in that they we have the majority of our funds, at least at our community foundation, our donor advised funds, which is a donor uh, has put their funds here at the community foundation, and they then identify where they want their dollars to go. Um, and oftentimes they do reach out to our staff and say, you know, I'm interested in issue X, Y, or Z. Who are the organizations that are serving in that area and or what's the main issue that's in that sort of area? Can you help just give me a little bit more information um, just to maybe help me get a little bit deeper in my investment? So we do help donors who are looking to really amplify their giving and ensure that it's being directed in, that, in a helpful way. Um, so I do we want to get a little idea about sort of who is at the table here at the, the arbitrary table, who's in the room with us. And so um, we want to do just a quick little poll. Those of you who have your sort of computers up in front of you, you can also see it on your handheld if that's where you're at. Um, we're, one of the things we want to know is what is your organization's primary focus area? Um, and so Teresa is going to um, launch that. And so you might need to scroll a little bit to be able to see um, the different options. But what is your organization's primary area? And Teresa, are you able to launch that? I don't see it. Is anybody else? Yes, it's launched. Okay. You should be able to access question one. I don't see it. Is anyone, am I the only one not seeing it? 
Uh, I see it, but it's launching all three questions. Ah. Uh, but that, but I'm a co-host, so that might be different for me. I can see all three questions as well. I don't mind that then. Okay. Someone else sees all three. So that won't be as helpful then. Um, all right. So just answer the first one and then um, we can let it go, I guess, from there. Uh, but one of the things that makes the community foundation, at least our community foundation, unique is that we aren't focused on a specific issue. Um, most of our grant making does span everything from animals to um, veterans. I think that's the aid. I think that's usually our A to V that we have. Um, and so a lot of our grant making does is sort of across the, the spectrum of giving. And which is why we really try to be the community foundation for all organizations um, in our in our footprint. So that's helpful. I'm not sure if seeing the results is going to be all that helpful. So we'll move on. So let's look at us at a glance then. All right. So um, we are we um, kind of looking at us at big picture is that we have awarded over 244 million since inception. Uh, we like to be able to acknowledge that we've given away more than we currently have in our in, in our sort of coffers if you will um, and so again we focus on all areas you see there sort of the how it's the if you look at the picture it it is sort of backwards i mean i use it so 2022 is on the left and it goes all the way to 2009 we've been around since 1984 um, and we were started by a nice little grant from the united way actually so we're we're close partners with united way um, and so we gave out 16 million um in you know at in fiscal year 22 um, and you see that big spike in, 19, in 2020 and 2019, those were COVID years. Um, and so it was nice to be able to really respond, but those are those big spikes that you see. But we've kind of continually grown in our giving over the last um, 30 plus years. So again, we do focus on all areas. And I should note that, you know, that 16 million you see, most of that is donor directed dollars. It is not our competitive grant making. So I do want to make that clear. And most of those funds are from our donor advised funds that are directly from the donor and reflected from the donor. So in FY22, which we um, kind of, that was a, a little while ago. So those are all grants. That was, we, when you think about big picture, the number of grants and amount of money going out, it was 2,743 grants that went to over 1,000 nonprofits. Most of them are here in the Midlands, are located here. Most of the money comes from here and stays here. And that was over $16 million. Uh, we are currently, when you talk about um, grantees that we call them actual grantees that have you did an application you you're doing a project of some sort you have evaluation and, and reports that come in there's a contract this team here that you see from the community foundation we are currently managing over 150 grantees um give or take kind of goes up and down depending on when things come in and come out but it's a it's a good significant group that um that our team really manages that tries to have a close relationship with and constant communication with so when you're looking at what it is that we actually do, um, we try to overall make life better in the Midlands. And we do that by investing philanthropically. Um, but all, but and when we say philanthropy, that's a whole lot of different things, right? It's your time, talent, treasure, your connections. We do try to make sure that if we know about something good that's going on, uh, we let other people know about it. There's opportunities out there from our other foundations or anything like that. We want to make sure we share that with you. Um, so. We're still on slide five. Yeah. Um, and so we want to make sure that we do that through our grant making, but also through scholarships. We're going to mention that here in a little bit. And that's for actual students who are attending formal education. Um, and so one of the things, like I said, is making connections. We try to make sure we connect people who are doing good work um, and who want to continue to serve our community. We do have a collection of nonprofit funds, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. They used to be called agency funds. But there are many nonprofits that do actually have a fund with us, and it benefits their organizations. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We have scholarships. We do have one award. That's a leadership award that we give from our board to another. And then, again, we have donor advised funds. We do competitive grant making. And last but certainly not least, our special initiatives, which the Midlands gives and Give 28. And I don't know if we have a slide about it, but we'll talk a little bit about that if we have time, just to make sure everybody understands some sort of timeline for some of that for the end of the, of the proposal, of, the, of those things. Okay, so let's talk nonprofit funds. So again, this used to be called agency funds, but these are funds for a 501c3 nonprofit. The, the actual nonprofit takes their own money and puts it into a fund, or they have a donor that wants to put it into a fund for them on their behalf. 
and they can make that endowed, which means that it's invested and, they're, and they get a, a, a annual payout, whether that's 4% or 3%, whatever that is, they get an annual payout or non-endowed. Um, and that is not restricted for the percentage that you can take out annually. So an endowed nonprofit fund can provide a source of ongoing revenue for a nonprofit to support your daily operations or any unrestricted needs you may have. The organization can choose each year if they wish, wish to withdraw some of the, the annual spendable allocation, like I mentioned, the 4%, or they can reinvest that allocation for quicker growth. Uh, and that's really what's best for long-term goals. Again, I want to reiterate, this is money that you already have or a donor already has that they put into a fund for you that, that grows because uh, we do invest that that grows and that directly supports your nonprofit. A non-endowed um, nonprofit fund can provide midterm growth. And those are options for things like if you have a project, like some sort of capital campaign, any big programmatic needs you might have, and the entire balance will eventually be depleted. We have a number of our nonprofits who are doing these, who have maybe they're going to purchase a building or they're doing some major renovations or they're doing a big million dollar capital campaign or whatever that is. Um, and they do a non-endowed um, fund with us as a place to hold that money um, that a donor can easily give to. And that's where it goes with the intention that. At the end of this campaign, we're withdrawing all of that money to do whatever that program is going to be, whether this purchase the building or whatever that's going to be. We have a number of nonprofits who also partner with us um, to hold up, hold their dollars that way. Um, so there are non-endowed and endowed ways of having a nonprofit fund. Whether endowed or non-endowed, a nonprofit fund can only go back and support the nonprofit that created the fund. There's no other way. Um, for anybody else to access that. And technically, it's not even your money anymore, which also keeps it safe from any litigation or anything else like that. Because it's money that was put away at our community foundation on your behalf. And only your organization can withdraw funds from it. There are many benefits to a nonprofit fund, including the fact that you have a pooled investment. All of our investments are pooled into a bigger fund. And as you all know, uh, the more money you have to invest, the less the fees are. Uh, so you would have the benefit of having a lower fee from the investment firm, and that currently we use Vanguard, uh, and then but still have higher returns on that. So you also have access to accounting and financial services that include monthly and annual reports, um, as well as an additional guidance from our staff as needed. Uh, we certainly try to make sure we spend as much time as we can with our nonprofit fund holders and provide a sounding board if they need that or just some um, additional support um, as well. So there is a link that you see there, yourfoundation.org backslash forward slash giving, uh, that you can find some information. You can also access our advancement team. We are certainly open to calls and conversations. So if you think this might be something that um, would benefit your organization, certainly reach out to our advancement team, or you can reach out to one of us. We can refer you over there to introduce you if you think. But just as a reminder, it is a bigger threshold, so $50,000, and there are a number of your organizations that do have an endowment already. Um, and or are looking to start one. So the minimum to start that fund is 50000 and it would grow from there. So if you have any questions, which I should have said earlier, if you have any questions, you can drop those into the chat because we are monitoring that throughout the conversation today. And we'll certainly try to get to it at the end if we don't get to it while we're talking. Uh, if you have any questions, drop it in the chat and or reach out to one of us later. But certainly you won't be the only one probably who has that question. So feel free to ask it to the whole group as we're talking. All right. So I'm going to keep talking for a little bit longer. So <laughs> the other thing I wanted to mention to you all is our affiliate fund. Um, and you all have heard of Central Carolina Community Foundation. Well, housed within us are actually smaller county foundations or community foundations. The Greater Chapin Community Foundation, which serves the uh, Chapin, White Rock, Peak, um, some of a little bit of a Newberry, sort of that whole community there. Uh, also the Orangeburg Calhoun County Foundation, County Community Foundation. Kershaw County Community Foundation and the Sumter County Community Foundation. All of those community foundations are housed within our foundation. Uh, and there are a few that have active um, boards already that are doing competitive grant making. The two that you see the stars, the Greater Chapin Community Foundation and the Sumter County Community Foundation all have local boards that are actively doing grant making. We'll talk about them in a minute in a little bit. So they actually have their own grant making that's a little bit smaller, but it's, it's good for their communities. And then also, all four of them also do matches during Midlands deals, which many of you know about that. If you're housed in one of these areas, you know about the matches that they provide. And they've been doing that for quite a while now through Midlands Gives. Um, so that's sort of how those affiliate funds work. And we'll talk again about Chapin and Sumter here in a little bit. 
So one of the things I want to um, sort of step in, just the last little thing to say is we, now we're sort of transitioning to um, competitive grant making and the work that this team is really doing. Um, and we work really closely with donors. We work really closely with nonprofits. That's really probably our sweet spot. We both know the most about you all uh, with our nonprofits and sort of match up um, investments that we have with our nonprofit. And in particular, our team really focused on our what we call unrestricted or discretionary grant making. Community Foundation has close to a million dollars that we ourselves um, uh, ask for applications for and manage. And we have um, in our board direct some of that. And then we also work closely with corporate sponsors and donors like AFLAC, like Sunoco, um, that we work with that um, we help do the administrative side of that. So when we're talking though about our discretionary grant making, we're really, really interested in increasing the livability and quality of life in our community. That is our overall big goal is we want people to have a high quality of life who are living here, our neighbors. Um, we want them to be able to enjoy enjoy life here with us in this community. We are also looking at philanthropy. So we're a foundation, right? So we want to help people increase their philanthropy, uh, whether that's growing in their own fund or thinking about ways that can make it easy for them to give, which explains why we do Midlands Gives and Give 828. We want to make it as easy as possible to give philanthropically, financially. Um, and if you remember, we check out, you can say, I want to volunteer. So also time. We make it as easy as possible for folks to try to give um, here in our community. Uh, and that's really um, the, the sort of background of how we started in Midlands Gives and Give 828. We also want to improve nonprofit capacity. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of our do dollars come out through donor advised funds. Um, and we really just kind of stood back and said, how can we make sure that investment goes to the best and highest use? Um, and so we thought making, trying to help ensure that our nonprofit community, you all, are the highest capacity you can be to be effective and efficient. Um, so therefore, when our donors are investing in you all, their money's being put to the best and highest use. We also reached out to a, a number of you all, did some focus groups and some conversations. And the feedback that we got was that there wasn't a whole lot of foundations who were funding capacity building, um, organization level capacity building. And so that was still a need because when budgets get tight, one of the first things that gets cut is, is sort of organizational infrastructure capacity, even staff capacity building, uh, because sometimes when times are lean, that's what you have to do. So we decided that would be a good area for us to sort of spend some time in. So we're increasing our investment. We're really looking for some opportunities there. Um, and that is in coordination with think Midlands Gives. We do have trainings that go along with Midlands Gives, but hopefully you can see how that can help build your capacity if you attend those trainings. Our African American Philanthropy Committee also specifically focuses on the capacity of um, black led and black benefiting nonprofits, as well as uh, nonprofit staff who identify as African American or black. Um, so there are some individual opportunities for capacity building through our African American Philanthropy Committee. And then certainly we work with our funders as well um, through some of, some of this work. And we've partnered with some other funders too to do some of this, like Together SC, United Way, we have good partnerships with them. We hopefully are trying to make it easier for you to navigate so you're not like, should I go to the community, you know, the community foundations, the United Ways? We're trying to kind of coordinate some of that so that you can access them in an efficient way. We also are very interested in ensuring that the organizations we are working with and that we partner with and we fund and that's on Midlands Gives, we want to ensure that it really reflects our community. So that look, we're, so when we're out there, we're doing our best to get to know some of you. We know this is all about relationships. And so one of our goals, you know, as, as staff people is that we're trying to actually be members of coalitions. We're trying to go out and meet folks who are in the community, nonprofits in particular, who are in the community doing this work. And then we also know that if you know us, you're more likely to apply. And if we know you, we're more likely to be able to then share your story and or more likely for you to be able to put together a good proposal that might get funded. So we're doing that as much as we can with networking and engagement. And we've heard from you as well that you all are sort of hungry, if that's the right word, for connecting again, that you want to be in community, you want to have that network. And so we're trying to help facilitate some of that. We also are doing some general offering support grants, and that's something that we've been doing now for um, this going into our third year. And that is funds that, that the organization has the discretion to be able to use um, how they see fit. It's not for us, it's not a program grant, for example, and those would be reoccurring dollars. And we are doing some of that, and we are going to continue to do some of that, um, and we'll talk about that here later. But that's sort of a new new realm for us, and we're getting more and more used to that, and our board is engaged in that and is, is excited about the direction of that. 
we certainly are, are still committed to the Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous communities, the BIPOC community, um, organizations that are led by, as well as organizations that are serving that community. You know, we are lucky enough to, be, to live in a very diverse, ethnically and racially diverse um, community and region. And so we want to make sure our grant making reflects that as well. And then beyond Richland County, uh, if there's anybody here, you know, raise your hand, right? If you're if you are not located in Richland County, which you know the majority of our nonprofits, there's you're out there, right? And so um, we're doing our best to try to reach outside of Richland County um, to some of our other counties to make sure that we know what's what's going on, and we want to make sure some of our funding certainly goes um, to, to outside Richland County as well. And that's one of our goals um, with with our grant making as well. Thank you, Pat. I see you. I, we we see you. <laughs> All right, so um, so if there's if there's not any questions just about sort of big picture where I just sort of gave you just now to give you an idea of who we are and how we do some of this work, I'll pass it over to Haley, and she can talk with you a little bit about some of the stuff we're working on this year. Hey, everyone. Uh, yes, we are about to start a new, for us, a new fiscal year, a new year of funding uh, starting uh, in really September is when our grants really get going. Uh, so now is a great time before we hit September to uh, just kind of do some housekeeping on all of the various accounts that you have with us. Um, we have two main uh, kind of databases that uh, we engage with y'all with. Uh, one is our grant portal. Uh, and one is Midlands Gives platform. So um, we recommend that you test your logins, make sure that you can get in. Um, you definitely don't wanna wait until the date that a grant is due <laughs> before you start testing things. Um, you know, it's technology, sometimes things go wrong. So good idea to test your logins right now. And in, this, in the same vein, uh, clean up your contacts as well. I know that there's a lot of uh, turnover right now in the nonprofit sector. Um, so we recommend uh, cleaning out the folks that are no longer there, making sure that your new uh, grant writers, development people, EDs, that they are all in uh, both the grant portal and Midlands Gives as appropriate. Um, whenever, uh, just a little note here that in the grants portal, whenever you first uh, try to create a new account, uh, it will ask you to create a new organization with it. And that kind of duplicates all the organizations in the system. Uh, so while that is not the worst thing in the world, you know, we can kind of clean it up on our end if needed. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just to, um, if you have new staff, email us, give us their email, their name, you know, address, phone number of the organization, all of that. Um, and we can actually add it to the existing uh, organizational profile so that it's already connected to all of your existing grants and applications, uh, all of that paperwork. So that's kind of the best practice for all of that. Uh, we also recommend that you uh, log into your GuideStar or Candid profile. Um, this is actually not only for us, but for other funders too. A lot of funders around the country will use their, uh, will research nonprofits using Candid. So the more information that you have in there, uh, you know, your mission, some of your programs, your financials, all of that, um, the, the better it is, the clearer picture um, as you're selling yourself to funders out there in the world. Uh, for our purposes though, also for our grant portal, we'll be adding more questions to, uh, to our applications where you can actually pull in exactly what's in Candid. It, you just, it automatically fills it in for you, uh, which saves you guys some time as you're filling out your application. So that might be something to, uh, to consider as well. Uh, finally, we do have uh, some ACH changes. Um, we do try to pay most or all of our grants by ACH wire transfer. Uh, we find that to be the, the safest and quickest way to get y'all the money that you've, that you've been awarded. Um, so we used to have a very kind of paper heavy way for that. Uh, now Chantrell has been, uh, has implemented a new DocuSign procedure for that. So uh, if you do get a grant with us and you don't already have ACH information on file, uh, we'll be contacting you for, uh, to get all of that registered in our system. But also if you have any changes, do contact Chantrell uh, so we can make sure that we are getting the money uh, straight to y'all uh, in the most timely manner. Okay, we'll go ahead and skip that. 
Thank you. Uh, so we implemented our new grant portal in 2021, I believe. So uh, many of y'all have probably been in the system. Um, however, you might have some new staff uh, that haven't been in the system yet. So feel free to, uh, to contact. Um, Chantrell is a good starting point for that, but also um, myself and Tremise can also uh, get you into the system, set you up. Um, this grant portal is great because you will have everything in it, your application, your contract, your reports, um, your payment details, all of that is in the system. So we really like it. Uh, we've heard great things from y'all. Um, so we, we do love feedback for it. So if y'all have questions about it or have feedback about the grant portal, feel free to shoot those our way too. Uh, some features of the of the grant portal for those who haven't used it or just some reminders for those where it's been a little while. Um, you can get to it from our website uh, on our and the, it's yourfoundation.org is our website. Uh, there's a little grants tab at the top. You can click it and on pretty much any of our grants pages we have either a teal button or a purple button that says apply here or grant portal. All of those will get you to it. Uh, we recommend bookmarking it as well so that you can uh, get to it on your own. Uh, but we do have it a, a lot on our website. Uh, and then we'll also, uh, you know, feel free to link you up to it if you contact us directly. Uh, this is a, a great, the grant portal also allows you to save your work and come back to it. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. So don't feel pressured to do that. Um, you can also take a look at the application beforehand, uh, collect the data that you need, uh, come back to it um, at a later date too. Uh, there's also some buttons in there to allow you to collaborate with some other folks that are in the system. Maybe you have a finance person uh, who you want to help with the budget, things like that. Um, it also, as I said, it allows you to import information from GuideStar. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, you can, uh, everything is in here, all in one, a one-stop shop, basically. So we, we like that a lot as well. Um, another cool thing that some of y'all might be interested in, for example, AFLAC grants, um, where you can apply multiple times or multiple years, year after year or cycle after cycle, uh, you can actually import many of your answers from past applications. It would have to be for an AFLAC grant your past AFLAC application. It wouldn't be, you couldn't pull from your connected communities application or something like that. Um, and it may not be every single question because we do add or take away some questions sometimes, but there is a little button that says uh, copy responses or copy answers. I forget exactly what it is. Um, and it will pull over a lot of your previous responses and that might help you to save time too, um, even if you uh, might wanna change still some of the nitty gritty details in the narrative. And then uh, finally, I did want to take a look at the actual apply page. Uh, after you log in, you're all registered, you'll hit uh, the apply button here at the top in the green uh, nav pane. And then you'll actually see a big list of all of our grants that are available at that time. Uh, there might be nothing available. Like right now, if you go, it's just a blank page. Um, things aren't now functioning. It's just not open yet. Uh, starting September 1st, we'll have a few things listed. You also uh, will want to make sure that you scroll down. Sometimes uh, your screen only shows whatever's on top, usually something like AFLAC, since it starts with an A, it's all, it's all alphabetical. Make sure you scroll down to see all the things, especially if you're looking for a specific grant. Um, some grants are hidden. Uh, they're only available uh, if you have a special password for it. Uh, for example, at Lynch's River or uh, I think Knight Foundation as well, some of those um, might, be, uh, uh, might be hidden just because there's a, only a specific group of people that are going to be applying to it or it's uh, by invitation only. Uh, you would enter, we'll give you that passcode via email. You would enter that passcode here at the top where it says enter passcode, enter code. Uh, and then once you click enter, then it will show up underneath here. And you might have to scroll as well to get to it. Another thing that's super important that trips a lot of people up is whenever you are, uh, let's say you wanna apply for AFLAC, a lot of people will read all of this. Then they'll go down here to this blue apply button right underneath it. That's actually the wrong application. There's a tiny little white line in between. Uh, yes, you'll you uh, in between each grant and you actually want to go to the top right 
of the grants box where the little red circle is there. That is the apply button for the AFLAC grant. And if you go, if you follow the little gray line at the top, it says AFLAC. So you just want to make sure that you're clicking the correct one. Every year, there's there's a number of people that uh, that will just go for this one underneath. Totally makes sense to me. I don't really like the way that this page is designed, but it's nothing that we can we can do about it, unfortunately. So I just want to bring that to your attention that you'll go to the top right of the box to hit that apply button. Do y'all have any questions so far before we move into kind of the specifics of our grants that are available this year? Can I take a breather because I know it's a lot of information. <laughs> yes, so thank you, Haley. Um, I, we're hoping that the grant portal is pretty intuitive and user friendly, but certainly reach out to us if you have any questions. You know, just today somebody said, well, I kept trying to apply and I kept getting an error message, so I just stopped. I was like, no, no, don't stop. Let us know. We can usually troubleshoot right there while you're on the phone. We can see exactly what you're seeing, actually. So we can usually figure it out while we're there. And we can work through it. So let us know if you're having any trouble. Um, so we're going to kind of transition now into our actual grant, our competitive grant making that we are doing. Um, and this is just sort of an example of when you see all the little logos there. Um, it, there's quite a few of them. And so we're going to try to stay as organized as we can. Um, there, are, You can certainly go on our website, and that's going to be my number one. Um, suggestion is to spend a little time on our website because all the information is there. Um, so just go ahead and start with the before you start under grants and initiatives and go through it from there. Um, you can look at our calendar, which should, which uh, it, it will tell you exactly when grants open and close. So we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Do start there. And then if you have any questions from there, reach out to the appropriate staff person. But our website, it, it, we try to have as much information there as we possibly can. So Starting at the top, we do have field of interest funds, which those um, are funds that are set up by donors who say, you know what, I'm passionate about X issue, whether that's you know animal welfare, education, leadership, whatever that is. I'm passionate about that, that issue, and I am leaving those funds at the community foundation, and I'm trusting that they are going to put those funds to the best and highest use. Um, that's, that's different than a donor who, for example, says, in my will, I'm going to leave all of my money to certain X organization. Instead, they say to an issue. Um, and so we then deploy the funds um, based on that specific issue to, to wherever the relevant needs are in our community at the time. So we use our field of interest funds sometimes to help supplement out of some of our grant making, but sometimes they're standalone grants. Um, if anyone, for example, is on the list but is a Mary Siebert grantee right now, which is for the benefit of animals and wildlife, um, your application will be opening September 1. You're actually applying. Um, and so make sure that you um, will send you the information about that. But but those are the kind of things that are specific to an issue. Uh, we do also house um, a few of funds that are, are, you guys probably know about Hooting the Blowfish. Their fund, their foundation is actually housed here at Central Carolina Community Foundation. Um, Tremise is the lead on that. That is by invitation only. I'll, I'll just let you know that. So they pick a specific issue they want to address each year. And Tremise and the rest of our team proactively go out and find organizations that they might think meet their needs for that year. It is multi-year funding. It is a statewide grant. I want to say that. Um, so um, the biggest thing is we just, you don't need to say, I want to apply for Hootie because you don't know what the issue is necessarily. They do pick a different issue each year. Um, so that's by invitation only. Uh, but they're doing incredible work. They just gave out another round of funding. It's multi-year, $10,000 a year for three years, doing really good work. Very interested in um, uh, the arts in public schools. And then outside of that, they'll pick another sort of issue. They'll do both a school project and some nonprofits. Uh, we do house the state's nonprofit disaster, I mean, the state's disaster relief fund, which is the one I see fund. Uh, most recently, it was activated for COVID for a couple of years, um, and that um, it, for right now, it is not being activated. And we're all going to keep our fingers crossed that we don't have to activate it again anytime soon. But it typically was used for a hurricane um, response, and it was initially started because of the floods here that we had uh, in 2015. So that is our disaster relief fund. We don't. We also have a fund here that's specific to the Midlands, the Midlands Disaster Response Fund, that also gets activated uh, in times of disaster, state declared disasters. Uh, we will talk about some of these other ones that have stars next to it. The Lynch's River Conservation Fund. Are we? We are talking about that, right, Shamise? Yeah. Okay. Good. Lynch's River Conservation Fund, AFLAC, or General Green Support Grants. So all of these grants will be discussed. Um, and so I won't need to go into, in, into incredible detail, but you'll see that we, in general, have grants opening in September. We have some in November. We have some in February and March. 
Is that our bucket? Or January? January. So you'll see that. We'll talk through exactly when it is, but want to make sure you have these dates on your calendar. And you see it's a, a big, diverse group of grants that we are offering. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place this year. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Different offerings that. every month. <laughs> Let us know your feedback on that at the end of the year, if that worked for you or not. But yes. Yeah. We'll jump into then and talk about AFLAC now with Haley. Uh, sure. So I oversee our AFLAC grants, and uh, I will start this by saying I'm in talks right now, and AFLAC might be changing a okay. few things. Um, they've received a, a lot, a tremendous number of applications over the last couple of years, and it's becoming um, difficult to to make sure that uh, that everything is, um, uh, you know, that everything is read and and uh and processed basically um we want to make sure we spend good time on these as as they review everything so uh so they are looking at maybe tightening up some of the criteria or maybe changing some of uh maybe the dates that they are open or something like that we're not quite sure yet uh so what i recommend is to um is to definitely check out the AFLAC website on our website uh, to make sure that um, uh, to make sure that you understand any new criteria or new changes to the program before you apply. Uh, so that's just kind of getting that out there so everybody is aware. In general, though, here in the past, um, they have funded uh, their areas of interest have been in the realms of health and well-being, which is very broad an education, which is also very broad. That's one reason that we get a lot of applications. We also get a lot of applications because uh, this is open to any nonprofit in South Carolina. It's a statewide grant. Um, so it is a very competitive process. Um, one thing to, uh, to help make yourself a little bit more competitive is um, for the areas of interest in health and well-being. Uh, there is a, a priority focus on uh, families are, uh, excuse me, on nonprofits that are serving uh, families dealing with pediatric cancer. Uh, and in the education realm, they're most interested in supporting K-12 support and also life skills. Um, so just kind of keep those in mind um, as you're crafting your programs. There are two cycles for this every year. The first cycle is coming up September 1st through September 30th. Um, this is for a program year, meaning you'll actually do the work uh, from January to December of 2024. The uh, next application period after that is from March 1st to March 31st. That is for a program year where you're actually doing the work from July 2024 until June 2025. I might have those numbers wrong, but uh, but basically it's, it's you can see it's a January, December project, July to June. That might affect uh, basically what you if you have like a school program, for example, um, or if you have something that otherwise is kind of time sensitive, um, then uh, you can kind of decide which one you want to apply for. But you can also apply uh, in both if you'd like. Um, nonprofits that currently have a grant open with AFLAC um, are not able to reapply until after their entire grant period has ended and they've submitted their final report. So that's something to also be aware of. If you don't know if you are eligible or not, uh, please reach out to me because uh, I don't want you to spend your time on the application if you are not eligible. Um, and I can look up all of our records and make sure that you are eligible to apply. Um, uh, as, as one of my colleagues says, AFLAC is an incredibly uh, philanthropic company. Uh, there's two grant cycles per year. Uh, they fund over 40 organizations. So this is not a, a tiny little grant amount that they do, um, but, uh, but it is a very competitive process. Uh, and this grants for up to $10,000 for different programs. And we can skip that one. So uh, some other grants that I oversee are capacity building grants. And I just want to double check that everyone understands what we mean by capacity building, because I know that's kind of a, you know, kind of a buzzword in the in the sector. Um, and not everybody uh, knows what that means. Uh, capacity building is your capacity is kind of how you run your organization, your ability to run the organization as not just a nonprofit, but as a business, how do you keep your doors open? How do you, uh, you know, have your staff and your finances and your technology and your facilities, all of these things outside of the programmatic work you do with your clients? 
that is what capacity building grants are meant to focus on. They're, help, they're helping you to run your business, basically. Um, so we have, uh, as Aaron said, we actually uh, try to invest a lot in our nonprofit uh, capacity building projects. Um, we've got three right here, and then uh, Aaron is also going to um, uh, Aaron is going to talk about uh, uh, the Sumter County one as well. Um, first and foremost, this is kind of in uh, chronological order. First, we'll talk about Jumpstart grants. Uh, the application for this is open the first through thirtieth. Um, we will also be having an information session on September 1st. Um, actually, I think it's at 11 a.m., not at 9 a.m. Um, and so uh, that will be recorded. That will be posted on our website. So if you can't make it, that's okay. But that is required as part of the application. Jumpstart is really cool. It is basically giving you the technology and the technological assistance, the TA, to uh, be able to fundraise, to have your uh, have a donor management system outside of, you know, if you just have Excel right now, something like that, which I know I had it at uh, the organization where I uh, where I worked, um, or if you're really looking for a step up and maybe different uh, CRM software, um, something that uh, really helps you to connect with donors and organize them better. Um, this provides a year of that software. It also provides a year of of coaching for using the software and also for fundraising um, and using technology to fundraise as well. Uh, so we don't leave you hanging whenever we give you uh, the access to the software itself. Uh, so this is a matching grant. There is some uh, between $500 and $1,000 that you also put into this program, uh, but it's a really wonderful program. We've had some, some great results of um, our uh, cohort uh, actually, you know, increasing the amount of dollars that they raise per year, um, and then also just getting that, uh, building that capacity for uh, for how to better fundraise for their organization. Thus, jumpstart grants. Um, next, we have uh, something. I'll, I'll start number three with fundraising school here. Um, that's open from November first through thirtieth this year. Um, a little bit different time than last year. I think it was in February last year. Uh, fundraising school also helps to build your fundraising capacity, your ability to fundraise. This is a virtual program. It's a six week long program. Uh, you meet Tuesday mornings in February and March, and it's for two people uh, in your organization. They can be uh, staff members, they can be board members, one of each. They can uh, be a you know, volunteer that's very, um, uh, that is very helpful with doing your, helping with your fundraising work. Um, it's taught by Rachel Ramjitan and Janet Cobb. Uh, they are well-known uh, certified fundraising professionals, um, and we've worked with them for a number of years, and we, we really love their work. Uh, so this is a program that uh, would really, it helps you to develop plans, uh, create your case for support, um, it also helps you to feel more comfortable with making that ask. So this is for uh, organizations that are maybe on the smaller side, small and medium organizations that have um, that don't have development staff or who have people that are starting out or are new to this field can really be a great crash course in how to fundraise effectively. Then finally, in the middle here, we have organizational capacity building mini grants. Um, again, this is for your organization. This is not for a program that you have serving the public. Uh, these grants are for up to $5,000. Typically, what it does uh, is it allows you to hire a consultant to help you with things like uh, building a strategic plan, a fundraising plan, um, a technology plan with your, uh, can help you with your, um, succession planning, uh, help you with board development, with leadership development, with, um, with all kinds of things that really help your organization run better. Um, this application period is from November 1st through 30th. Um, and I said, as I said, these are for up to $5,000. Um, the program year is uh, from March to September in 2024. So those are our capacity building grant options this year. Again, we'll have all of this on our website too. Each one of these has its own web page so you can get a lot more information on. All right, so what I'm gonna talk about is the Sumter County Community Foundation, which directly falls right after the capacity building conversation. So we intentionally put this here because Sumter County Community Foundation 
is really interested in building the capacity of the nonprofits that are housed in Sumter, not necessarily just serving Sumter, but you have to have a physical location in Sumter. Now, there are some of your organizations that might have multiple locations. As long as you have a physical office staff who are housed in Sumter, then they're interested in working with you, and they're really trying to build the infrastructure of nonprofits that are serving uh, the Sumter County, uh, full Sumter County. So they are, the, the, the parameters are actually almost mirror those of the capacity building mini grants. Uh, Sumter County is opening theirs first, which is September 1 through 30th, and the Community Foundation is opening ours November 1 through 31st, I guess it is 30th. Um, so if you have an organization housed in Sumter, we encourage you to first apply for this one, um, you, and it is for the same sort of, of information like building the infrastructure, the capacity, whether that's you know, sometimes we've had some organizations, which is true for a lot of you on the call right now, who are looking at succession planning because your CEOs and EDs are ready to retire, rightfully, understandably so. But having that, that succession plan, putting together the big picture, strategic plan, board development, big picture ideas, even disaster fund, disaster plan management, all of those kind of things. I think we all are very aware of after COVID, we were all like, we don't know how to work from home. We don't know how to sign documents anymore. All those kind of things. You can put that infrastructure into place. If you're housed in Sumter County, we encourage you to apply for that one first. Um, they haven't necessarily put a top end on the request, but we do have the average amount that was awarded last year, just so you can have some context um, as to really the request amount, what it should be closer to. So it was 2,300 last two years ago, I should say. Um, so that's Sumter County Community Foundation. Application is pretty simple. They have a local board made up of uh, people who live in and love Sumter. Um, so they will know who you are when you apply, which is great. Um, and those applications go directly to the Sumter County Community Foundation Board, and they review those and will get um, an answer to you so you can start your programming early by January. Uh, they also do Midlands Gives Matches. Um, and so they hold a little bit of money aside for organizations that are housed in Sumter County that on midlandsgives.org, that Sumter is listed as your home county. Uh, they also provide matching dollars for organizations that participate in Midlands Gives Day. That's in May. Um, and so they'll, um, so that's the other thing they provide with Sumter County Community Foundation. That foundation is really growing um, and they're a good group to connect with. So I want to make sure, it, again, I'll say it again, if you're housed in Sumter, please do consider applying um, for uh, for the capacity building grants and then certainly you'll be eligible for the Midland Gives Match. Okay. Next slide is our Greater Tampa Community Foundation, which is rocking along. This is really made up of a group of local people who love and care about uh, the Greater Chapin area, which does include Valentine, Chapin, Little Mountain Peak, Prosperity, and White Rock. Um, their overall goal is to uplift and strengthen the organizations that are addressing the needs in their community. Um, in this situation, you don't necessarily have to be housed in uh, Chapin, but you have to have it very, very clearly that you are serving, intentionally serving the people of Chapin. It can't just be like, well, we serve everybody and Chapin's part of everybody. It needs to be able to say, we have a program that's directly in that community. And this is what we're doing, and we have measurable outcomes. Um, so they will have an application open. It is to, to provide just basic, like, what is your service that you're providing? And you apply um, for that. It is not a capacity building grant. Um, it is also open September 1 through 30th. Again, the average award was $1,400. Um, it goes up or down a little bit, depending on what the need is. That was the average award uh, for organizations um, serving, intentionally serving that community. They as well offer Midlands Gives matches. Now, their matches are specifically for organizations that are housed in Chapin. So their grant is open to anyone who is serving it intentionally. Their Midlands Gives matches are open to those who are who have a physical address. That's their home home address um, is actually in the greater Chapin area. So if anybody has any questions about that, certainly let uh, me know about either Sumter or, great, Sumter or greater Chapin. Okay. So hi, everyone. Now I will share some information about a few of the grant projects that I work with here at the foundation. Um, the first one that I will talk about is the Knight Foundation. And the Knight Foundation support Columbia's work in revitalizing um, our downtown and riverfront development to attain and retract to retain and attract talented people in the region. Um, Knight invests in Columbia's core city vibrancy to support civic engagement, smart design, the arts and entrepreneurship. Um, projects for the Knight Foundation 
are projects from Richland County only, and there is a focus in the city of Columbia, but those projects should be from Richland County only. There are three tactics or focus areas that we're looking for with the Knight Foundation funding um, for those for this year. And um, the first one is building on assets. So how can a project better connect the community to keep assets in Columbia, such as our universities, corporations, or nature? Um, the second is public spacing. So looking at projects that enhance the public realm to be more connected and more vibrant. And then lastly, civic engagement, and that will support projects that break down barriers between residents and decision makers, especially those who are typically underrepresented in civic life and leadership roles. Um, there is not a grant amount for this, but I will share a range um, just to give you some context, between fiscal year 21 and 22, um, grants average approximately $70,000 per award. So that just gives you some context. Um, we accept applications year round for a night. However, these grants are invitation only. So the first thing that you would do would contact me if you are interested in night and if you think your organization has a project that aligns with night. Um, and although those applications are submitted um, at different times throughout the year, we do have those conversations throughout the year to help a community get ready to apply or an organization get ready to apply if we um, see that the project is a good fit for the night foundation. Okay, I think we got everything. All right. Okay. Next slide, please. So next I'll talk about Connected Communities. And Connected Communities has been a signature grant of the foundation since 2015. It is a collection of CCCF supported projects that improve livability, quality of life, community attachment, and satisfaction. And we do this by increasing Midlands residents' easy access to six different focus areas. So a project can fall into one of these focus areas and that's safe places to live and work, healthcare facilities and services, quality job opportunities, affordable housing, safe, proximal, high quality recreational areas, as well as quality arts and culture. If you are applying for a grant for the Connected Community Project, it should enhance community connections in our 11 county service area. Your project should take a novel approach or it must be innovative in creating a vibrant and connected community. It should raise public awareness about the region or the area. Um, we would like to see a project that has a measurable level of community involvement. And um, one way that we measure that is through the number of volunteers and participants that a project will serve. Um, your project should be a new project or an expansion of a current project. Um, if it's a project that's already operating within your organization, that's really not the type of project that this um, grant would fund, but how can you expand your project? And when we say expand the project, we're not talking about, you know, you were serving 10 people, now you're serving 20, but really how is this funding being used to help you do something different um, and innovative with the project that you already have? Um, lastly, your project should promote philanthropy across the region. Next slide. If you are interested in a Connected Communities grant, you should be a 501c3 public entity, education institu institution, or faith institution. Um, in order to apply for this grant, an organization must also be registered on Midlands Gives. And if you are familiar with the Connected Communities grant, we do have a changes from last year. Um, this year, grants must be between the $10,000 and $60,000 range. So um, if you apply, your application must be at least $10,000, and we've increased the request amount to $60,000 for this year. We've also reduced the match a little. So um, if you're applying for a year one grant, the match requirement is 20%. If you're applying for a year two or a continuation of an existing project, that match requirement is 30%. And if this is your third year applying for an existing project that was funded through Connected Communities, that match requirement will be 40%. Next slide, please. 
So I'll talk about the application process. Those applications will open September 1 and close September 30th, and that will be the first round of applications, similar to an LOI. The second round, um, applicants will be invited to submit a full application, and that application period will be from October the 20th through November 17th. Um, applicants will be then invited to the final stage of this application process, which is a presentation to our committee. Um, and that will take place in January, but you'll be notified um, as you move along the application process. If your organization is funded for a community grant, the project timeline will be from March 1st, 2024 through February 28th, 2025. And lastly, I will share some information about our general operating support grants. In 2021, the foundation began awarding general operating support grants, and they provide unrestricted funding to support an organization's mission. With these grant funds, it is our hope that organizations will be able to respond to community needs faster and more effectively. Nonprofits will receive $10,000 per year for up to three years um, for a total of $30,000 if they are awarded this grant. Nonprofits can use the funds based on their organization's needs and priorities, and this is becoming best practice in philanthropic grant making. While the funds will be used up to the nonprofit's discretion, we do ask that nonprofits commit to four things if they do receive this grant. Um, the first thing is to expense the funds annually. So this is a three-year grant, and we would like for you to expense the full 10000 per year at the end of each grant year. To complete an annual self-assessment, um, and this is a way that we help provide some capacity building through this particular grant. So there is a self-assessment that organizations complete. Um, be on Midlands Gives, register your nonprofit there. And the last thing is to maintain regular communication with the foundation um, throughout the grant period. Organizations that receive general operating support um, funding, we do have networking opportunities and different opportunities for those organizations. And we really want to maintain ongoing communication with the foundation as well as other grantees that may be in your cohort. So as far as the application process goes, um, the round one application will open January 1 and it will close January 31st. And then we do have an applicant interest webinar um, that will happen January 4th. And we will go into a little more detail um, about the eligibility and the expectations of this grant. And then this grant also has a round two presentation and that will be invitation only based off the application that was submitted. Um, will you present to our committee and answer any questions that the committee has? The project timeline for this grant is three years. So the grant start date would be June 1st, 2024, and it will go through May 31st, 2027. And we will have annual check-ins and annual reports with this grant. Um, one last thing, we are still determining the eligibility for this year's general operating support grants. And that will be shared through our newsletter as well as on our website at a later time. In general, the general operating support grants have supported communities that have been traditionally underserved by philanthropy. So I just want to remind you to make sure that you've signed up to receive our newsletter. Um, you follow us on social media, you open emails from us if you receive them, because we will be sharing additional information regarding the el eligibility requirements for the general operating support grants for this year. There we go, here I am. Last but not least, some scholarship information. Uh, this might be of interest to you if you have graduating high school seniors in your own household or, or your own family or friend circle. Uh, also, if you are serving any students who are going to college or who are in college, um, please do help us to spread the word about the, the existence of these scholarships. We oversee about 50 different scholarship funds. They are all completely different. Uh, they are very wide variety of uh, students that we um, that we award. Um, this past year, we just finished getting out uh, most of our funds. 
uh, $620,000 to 195 students. Um, and so a total of 6.2 million since we started the scholarship program in 1998. So this is a very, um, uh, really wonderful way that we help support our community students. Um, I have some statistics here that um, most of the awardees are women, almost half are people of color, 23% uh, are first generation college students, um, and 72% of scholarships were paid to South Carolina schools. So we're actually keeping a lot of this money here in state, um, which we love to, uh, to support our, um, our local community as well. The median scholarship is $2,000. We've actually um, revised some of our scholarship policies in order to have a deeper impact for the students. Uh, so we are now requiring all of our new scholarship funds, for example, to be a minimum award of $2,000. We're trying to bump up the ones that we currently have to that level as well. Um, and, uh, and we just wanna make sure that we are also trying to do renewable scholarships too. That's really gonna help students to actually make it to the end and to graduate, which is really the goal of going to college. Uh, most of our scholarships are need-based as well. Uh, we do have some others that are uh, for specific populations too. Uh, our online application is from January 1st through March 5th. Um, this will be for the next academic year, so for the 24-25 academic year. Um, and uh, we do ask that people start early for that, and we recommend that because there, uh, we do request uh, some recommendations with that. And so we want to make sure that those uh, that those folks have enough time to complete their their form as well before that application is due. So um, so that's it about scholarships, just kind of an FYI for all of y'all to know. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I want to try to get through um, this next bit as quickly as we can. Um, these are some tips for not only writing a CCCF grant based on all the grants that we see and kind of some of the um, uh, some of the trouble spots that we see with a lot of applications, uh, but this these hopefully these tips will also help you to develop your programs better and to write grants better for um, for other funders as well. So hopefully this will be useful. Um, I also encourage y'all to check out the um, uh, the grant seeking and the grant writing trainings that are offered by the South Carolina State Library. Um, they do offer those I think in the spring and in the fall. So if you go to their website, again, it's the South Carolina State Library. Um, that's not SC State University. That's the State Library of South Carolina. Um, they have librarians there that also can help you with uh, finding grants and, and doing some of your grant writing as well. So, um, so I encourage y'all to check that out. But just kind of very quickly, um, before you uh, start writing grants and looking for funds, you really need to make sure that you have a solid program in mind. Um, and you want to, uh, uh, this will help you to keep what your grant application relevant to what the uh, funder wants to fund, uh, but it also just uh, helps your organization to do a better program as well. So you need to think about all these different questions, so many questions to answer. Um, you know, what is the need and how do you know? Um, how are you gonna help the folks that need it out there? Um, what are your goals, your objectives, your activities? Uh, some people uh, might want to do a logic model. I know uh, Aaron likes logic models a lot. Not everybody thinks that way, but sometimes it really can help you uh, pull through uh, uh, the information about everything you need for how you're going to get this project done. Uh, you want to think about the end. How are you going to measure your success? How are you going to? What are your outcomes, and how are you going to measure them? You'll want to think about when the program will take place, for how long or how often it might be taking place. Um, you want to think about what your organization's capacity is, what staff members you have, what funding you have, uh, what expertise you may have, what partners you might need to bring on in order to get the work done. Uh, you also want to think about who will be doing the work on your staff or your partners. Uh, where will the program be taking place? Uh, that may help, especially with uh, groups like the our community foundation. It, we fund or uh, programs in our community in the Midlands. So if really most of your program is gonna be taking place in Charleston, that might not be a grant that we might fund. You might wanna check out the Charleston Community Foundation Postal. Um, then you wanna also think about your budget. Always gotta think about budget. 
So this hopefully will help you to develop a good program. I always like to think about uh, whenever you translate all of this into a grant application or some kind of request for, uh, for funding, you just really want to think about those, those W questions. Who, what, where, when, and why, and how as well. <laughs> the other, the non-W question. All of those, if you can answer those, uh, then that will really help you to, uh, to be able to communicate what your program is to others who are outside of your organization. Next slide, please. Then uh, here's some quick tips on writing your grant proposal. Again, this is for CCCF grants, but can work for anything. I have a star here next to the elevator speech. Uh, your elevator speech is basically you being able to summarize your program in a minute, basically as long as it takes for you to, if you're on an elevator with a funder, how long it takes for them to get to their floor and walk out. So it's a really quick thing. If this takes time and practice to really uh, perfect your your elevator speech what you see this as on our applications is we have a question on pretty much all of them and other funders do too that just says what's your grant purpose summarize this program in three sentences so that is critical because so many of our reviewers who are volunteers uh, in our community they are going to look at that as kind of the entry point into what the rest of this grant is and if they look at that and they're still like i'm sorry what are they doing or it's more talking about the, the research and the context than it is about we are serving X number of people at this location by doing this activity, they will be able to do X outcome. If it's beyond that, then they're gonna lose interest and it's really not gonna be as strong of an application. So you really wanna perfect that elevator speech or that, uh, the, that grant purpose as we have on our application. That's also going to be the little blurb that we use for any of our marketing, for any of our reports. Um, anybody who's looking at this, that's going to be the summary of your program. So you really want to make sure that that's in tip top shape. Um, next, you want to make sure that your uh, that what you're trying to do actually matches what the funder is looking to fund. Um, so something like with, for example, the AFLAC grant, if you're not really in the health field or education and you're just kind of trying to make it work, it's probably not going to be as strong of an application as those who are already in those areas that AFLAC wants to fund. Uh, next, this is hard. I know for me, it's hard for a lot of us in this sector is to actually sell it and to really use persuasive language, but also uh, active language to show that you're passionate about what you're doing, you know what you're doing, you have the expertise, uh, and that you can get this done, and that basically the funder's grant is a good investment in this program and in your organization. Next, you'll want to understand your target audience. Uh, this is basically thinking of who the funder is, but then also who's going to be reviewing these grants too. As I said, most of our reviewers, they are uh, volunteers. Some of them are board members. Um, some of them are uh, AFLAC uh, employees. Um, some of them for scholarships, they are people in the education field. Some of them just love students. Um, you need to think about the fact that these folks are not in your, maybe not even in the sector, uh, might not really understand what, uh, what you do. So you need to make sure you're speaking and explaining to somebody who doesn't really, who may not understand exactly what you do. I'm going to ask Tremise to jump in here to talk a little bit very broadly about, about how to uh, conceptualize your budget. Sure, thanks Haley. Um, so the first tip I wanted to share is just to make sure that you have thoroughly read the website and budget stipulations for the grant that you are applying to. Um, make sure you read those closely, see if there's any updates um, to the grant budget that you will need to add, but just being sure that you're very familiar with what's being asked for in the budget. If your request is a part of a larger project or if your organization has a larger project going on, um, make sure that you, the budget you submit is a total budget for the portion of the project that you are requesting CCCF funds for. Um, so just making sure you consider your full project and what part of the budget request and project information you should include in your budget that you're requesting funds for CCF for. Um, the budget that you submit is a supporting document, and it should provide context for your project. So some, when someone looks at your project in your application, 
um, your budget and your application, both things should align and what you've included in the budget should support your project. And it should be a direct reflection of what it is that you are trying to achieve with your project. Later this month, um, we will be sharing a video to provide some additional um, and more specific guidance on um, developing a CCCF budget for your project, as well as how to report out on um, project budgets if you do receive funding from CCCF. Thank you, Tremise. Yeah, I think that uh, that notion of the budget being the supporting document, uh, it can actually really kind of connect to that elevator speech, that grant purpose really easily. If you're saying we are going to serve 200 people meals uh, in one year, you know, uh, then your budget needs to say, okay, so what, what's this money actually paying for? Is it paying for the food? Is it paying for the staff? Is it paying for your facility rental? Is it, you know, that's really what should be outlined in that budget. Uh, finally, a few more tips. Uh, don't try to avoid jargon and a lot of, um, uh, yeah, just a lot of, of words and initials and all of that that, that uh, kind of the average person might not understand. Because again, the people choosing these grants are not potentially are not in this sector. Uh, you might want to ask someone to review your writing uh, that can also give give some good critiques if needed. Um, if, if they don't really understand what your program is, then neither will we. Uh, so having another set of eyes on it who might not be in your head, um, that might not know exactly what the program is, can really help to, to help you clarify what, uh, what you should be writing on your application. Uh, data is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, I see some people put in data for all of South Carolina, and it's a whole paragraph of all this kind of stuff that isn't really relevant to the exact thing that they're trying to do, whereas it would be more relevant to have here in Columbia, blah, 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 blah. Um, so there's there's some data is good. You do want to back, back up your uh, your program with, you know, you know there's a problem, here's how we know, um, but you also don't want it to be irrelevant, you don't want it to be too much and overwhelming as well. Uh, I know I have a problem with this, staying out of the weeds. Um, I like to uh, write and research a lot, and uh, again, people are, are reading these applications um, uh, sometimes quickly, and so you want to make sure that you can uh, keep their interest and keep it a high level enough so that uh, they understand what's going on. We also allow on most of our uh, on most of our grant narrative portions, uh, we do allow you to do bullet points. Um, and I recommend using those kinds of um, you can do bullet points, you can do bold and underline. Uh, I, I recommend you do that kind of stuff to really help you to um, help the reviewer to see, uh, to kind of understand and follow the way that you're doing it or the way that you're explaining instead of just one big block of text that can be very hard to read and to process. Uh, finally, always come to us if you have questions, if you're not sure about your program itself, if it's relevant for the grant, um, or if you are unsure about how to do the budget uh, or other kinds of questions, we are happy to help. This is kind of general stuff about what funders love. Um, we love to see collaborations and partnerships. Uh, we also love to see um, your generated interest and support beforehand. So tell us if you've received other grants or donations or other support, um, or if you have secured other partners for this project. Uh, we also love to see, depending on what the program is or the organization is, uh, we love to see the clients that you serve actually being part of the feedback that you get or your advisory committee or something like that, uh, because their, their lived experiences is, are so important to the work that you do. Um, and so we think that their, their input and feedback is, is essential, really. Um, then uh, most funders love to see the addressing of a well-documented and, and current need. Um, and then finally, um, a lot of funders like to see that positive, po excuse me, positive public exposure. They get their name out there and uh, other folks can know that they are supporting the community. And then I have this little uh, square here at the bottom. We also really like simple stuff like uh, getting like meeting deadlines and following instructions and uh, copy editing, proofreading, things like that. Uh, that will uh, only help to make your application stronger whenever you have a lot of other people that you might be competing with, with for the grant funding. 
And I think that's all I have as far as uh, some grant tips. I hope that was helpful. Um, like I said, you can also check out some, uh, some uh, more grant related trainings at the State Library. Oh, and as, as one of my colleagues said, we, we're also embedding budget tables in many of our grant applications. So you might not have that separate uh, grant or excuse me, budget document to fill out. Uh, we're trying. It's, it's kind of difficult for some people to understand, uh, even some of our committee reviewers to understand, too. So we're trying to simplify our budget process, especially for the smaller grants um, to maybe just having it be embedded in uh, in our application itself. Uh, we, this is time for questions. I did want to address one other that was specific to sponsorships. So we do have a lot of you who reach out about sponsorships, and and um, honestly, the community foundation doesn't really offer very many sponsorships. Uh, we are a community foundation for 500 plus nonprofits, and so we're not really able to uh, equitably and fairly offer that um, to everyone. So it's pretty limited. We don't have much of a sponsorship budget at all. Um, every once in a while, we have maybe our African American Philanthropy Committee might do a small one or something our board might choose um, or our, some of our teams just specific to an issue or some other um, sort of maybe a bigger event that happens. But in general, we don't do sponsorships for our nonprofits. So just wanted to make that known. I know a number of you reach out about that. But that's not typically something we offer uh, for our um, nonprofits here in the Midlands. Um, and I also wanted to touch briefly in the Chantry, I'm not sure if you wanted to do this, but Midlands Gives. Midlands Gives is housed within this department, and we're super excited about it every year, and Chantrell's done a great job of revamping some things. The timeline is similar again this year. Um, for annual registration, every organization who's on Midlands Gives will need to basically, you know, claim your profile, update your profile uh, in the month of Chantrell. When will that happen? That will start in December. So everyone would need to update their profile starting December to end of January. So two months to update your profile. If that is not done uh, before then, your profile will become inactive on our site and you'll have to kind of go back in. And we can certainly help you make that active again. But every year you have to go in and update that. So put that on your calendar, December 1 through January 31st. You're so sorry. Um, update that profile. Also, if you um, are new and don't yet have a Midlands Gives profile, if the organization's been around for at least, has financial information for at least one year, you can register for Mid on the Midlands Gives site anytime. It's no longer restricted to certain times of the year. So as long as your organization's been around for a year, you're registered with the Secretary of State, have your 501c3 um, standing with the IRS, then you can go ahead and start the application process to get your organization on MidlandsGives.org. It does take about 45 days to get through the whole process, sometimes less, the chanterelles incredible, um, but count on it being about 45 days. So get that started as soon as you can um, if you're interested in having your organization on Midlands Gives. We have uh, uh, over a thousand hits a month to that site. Um, it's a good place to be and there's, it's sort of a clearinghouse for all of our nonprofits. And I don't know if you noticed this, but a number of our um, grants now require that your organization have an active profile on MidlandsGives.org. So we're, we really recommend that you go ahead and do that if you don't yet have a profile on Midlands Gives and keep it current, please. Um, we know your contacts change. It's super important to go in and change and update that because you get some really good information and valuable information. So that was all. That was my little PSA. Um, does anybody have any questions in for us? You can either unmute or drop it in the chat. We're happy to answer that. We have about eight minutes remaining um, that we can answer any questions you might have. So Chantrell, you want to switch to the next slide so folks can know how to get in touch with us? You want to go ahead and do that section? Chantrell? So if you want to get in contact with us, there's everyone's email with their extension number. With the main number is 803-254-5601. You can get in contact with me um, just about any questions that you will have. And if they're really specific, I will get you in contact with Aaron Tremise or Haley. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at CCC of Pitt and on Facebook at Central Carolina um, Community Foundation as well as LinkedIn. And please make sure to sign up for the nonprofit newsletter. That's where we will drop all of our um, grant opening, Midland Gifts trainings, or any webinars that we're doing for the year. Thank you, Chantrell. It looks like we do have a couple of questions coming in. 
Um, yes, it's the State Library of South Carolina in Columbia. They do teach grant writing and also grant seeking classes. Uh, I believe that they have a um, also access to the uh, Foundation Center directory as well. Um, so yes, they, they would be the ones that you would check out for, uh, and I believe they're all free too, I think. Um, then uh, someone else asked, Lori asked, uh, will we get a copy of this presentation? Yes, we are recording it and we will be posting it on our website, probably under the before you start uh, page that we have. Um, and we'll also try to email this out to all of our registrants too, because I know that there were a few people who weren't able to, to attend with us today. Uh, Stacy asks, would a capacity building grant help fund a consultant that helps an organization with fundraising strategies? Yes, we do. Um, uh, we do allow uh, the development of a fundraising plan uh, to be part of that. It wouldn't pay for staff time to actually do the fundraising or, or anything like that. But yes, a, a development of a fundraising plan would be an acceptable uh, project for that. Now, I want to clarify what Haley just said to make sure everyone heard that because we see this um, a number of times. It does help pay for consultants. It does not help pay for implementation of anything that, that a plan. It helps pay for a plan, a strategy, but no implementation for any of any of this. So just re remember that not only fundraising, it certainly cannot be used for fundraising activities, but it certainly can help you put together a plan for that, it helps put together a plan for you know, your technology, whatever those are, but those are plans, not the implementation. Yeah, it doesn't pay for staffing costs or for uh, like marketing materials, things like that. And again, that's the that's the uh, capacity building grant that that uh, information is specific to. Okay, yeah, it looks like um, someone dropped in the state library um, classes, grant writing classes in the chat as well. So you have a link there. And to reiterate oh, what. Um what, what Chantrell did say, we really encourage, if you have not signed up for our bi-weekly, whatever it's called, every other week, um, nonprofit newsletter, we really put most of our information in there. Um, and anyone can sign up for it. We try, it's a, it's a quick read. It's usually one to two minutes, like top, um, that goes out, that gives you important information, how to register, dates, any of those kind of things. It's, tr it's not intrusive at all. Um, it doesn't have to be the executive director that signs up for it. Anyone on your team can sign up for it. Kind of sometimes you guys forward it along and then someone reaches out and says, can you give me some more? We can, you can add yourself to that. So please do go into um, to our um, grants and initiatives page and scroll down before you start, scroll down and sign up for our nonprofit newsletter. We did have a question about updating the Mintless Gifts profile now. You can't update it now. You have to wait to December because we will make everybody updated at one time. So if you update it now, you can. It's great that you can update it now to make sure you have the correct contact information, but you will have to do another update in December. Right. You can update it anytime you want, but we'll require you to do it again, which could just be that you just press submit again. But please update it anytime you know the information has changed throughout the year, but you'll yes. be asked to do it again in December. So don't wait if you know there are changes that need to be made. All right, looks like um, we may be um, towards the end. So thank you all so much for giving us your time. We appreciate you. Um, connect with us, sign up for nonprofit newsletter, reach out to our incredible team um, if you have any questions. And we hope many of you want to apply starting in September. Take a look at the grants that are being offered. Um, and we're looking for a really forward to a really good year with you all as partners. So thanks a lot. Thank y'all so much.